I am uh, Jorge Sanchez Guerrero from University and Toronto of Toronto and Dr. Jill Vallon from New York. The speaker today is Dr. Roger Levy. He is professor of rheumatology at the State University of Rio de Janeiro, scientific director of the Rio de Janeiro Rheumatology Society. He is the coordinator of the Vasculopathies Commission of the Brazilian Society of Rheumatology, fellow of the Federico Foundation, and chairman of the upcoming 14 Antiphospholipid Antibodies International and the 4th Latin America Autoimmunity Congress in Rio de Janeiro next September. So, Roger, Thank welcome. you. Thank you for the introduction. So it's a great honor to be here at this amazing Congress, uh, so well organized. I think uh, Bernardo, Mari Carmen, and Luisa, the Gladell group is, did a great job, or still doing. It's a great honor to have Jill Byron also at the, the chair, the <laughs> chair in the session. We have learned so much from her work, and uh, I think she deserves also uh, big honor here. So we're going to talk about this um, problem in our daily practice that is when our patients uh, arrive pregnant. And I think the most important uh, message that I want to, to give you today at the end will be that the key word here is planning. So we won't have to face so many problems and we can, we can have an uneventful pregnancy with the baby going home and the mother in good health. Uh, have some disclosures here. Um, so, as I was saying, I think our talk here starts with counseling and talking about the right timing and adapting the medication your patient is using uh, when they are planning or thinking about getting pregnant is crucial. Um, we want also to talk about the, the differences and the common features that can confound us when our patient presents with hypertension, proteinuria, edema, it can be related to lupus nephritis, it can be related to antiphospholipid microangiopathy, or it can be due to preeclampsia. And it's sometimes very difficult to differentiate right there. So it's a tricky situation and we have to act fast. Um, we have to be aware of the impact of the various forms of lupus and the different organ involvements and how can this impact in the fetal outcome. And we have to talk about anti-roll, although tomorrow we'll hear more with Professor Bayan, and uh, lupus, neonatal lupus. And also we'll talk a little bit about antiphospholipid syndrome and how to take care of this woman with APS, with lupus or without lupus during pregnancy. So we know that pregnancy is a special immune situation for the mother because of course she has to live with a graft that may sometimes, most of the times, be strange. So there is an immune adaptation that is related to an increase in Th2 cells and you remember lupus is a Th2 disease so it may be something that will increase even more the, the flares and the possibility of a flare and the Th1 is important in the early phase. And when the patients develop, uh, those that develop preeclampsia, this is due to this disbalance in Th1 increasing when we wanted to have more Th2 at that time. Um, we know that interferon gamma and IL-1b are decreased, and other pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, TNF, and IL-1 are increased. There is a dysregulation of uh, the Treg cells too, and it's another uh, cluster of cells that are fundamental in the pathogenesis of lupus, and there are very interesting and detailed uh, references recently published by our friend Ian Bruce 
that deal on this topic, and we'll go over this. Um, there is an increase in the response, not in the number, but uh, the activity of the decidual, the placental natural killer cells, and also an expression of uh, certain types of HLA that do not uh, start an immune recognition. And when we talk about the medication that we use, we have to understand that not only they have a different impact during pregnancy and in the fetus, but also the pharmacokinetics and the dynamics of the drug distributions can change during pregnancy. And that classification that we follow in certain ways from the FDA that classifies A, B, C, D, these are sometimes tricky too, because most of that um, uh, classification is based on animal studies. And the warnings that we have there are usually because we don't know an effect and not because we know there's a harm harmful effect. And for our desperate, to make our situation a little bit more uh, desperate, most of the pregnancies that we see are not planned. So that's why I said in the beginning, and I will keep repeating, that counseling and planning is, if we can do at least that, it would be a good job. <laughs> so, um, this review that I was telling you that Ian Bruce published recently reminds us of a successful pregnancy depending on the production of a series of immune markers, and that involves uh, also the T. H17 cells that are increased and decreasing Treg cells. And this has also an impact in lupus. So there is a pro-inflammatory response and how come a patient with lupus can uh, support that and not uh, flare up during the pregnancy. Um, this reminds me of uh, Murray Urovitz's talk. This is one of my patients in, in the clinic. She's uh, 81 years old. She has uh, lupus the year I was born. And she had three children, five grandchildren, and she's doing okay now, but recently she had a, a vertebral um, fracture. So the dogma that we learn uh, in the 80s, in the 70s, that lupus women were not supposed to get pregnant, that it, this was going to be bad for them in every situation. It's not so real. Our professor that is one of the leaders in this field, Professor Kitridu, she uh, publishes at the Dubois book every uh, year, the chapter, every edition of this chapter, and you can see the change in the prognosis from the early studies in the 50s where it was where she was convinced then that lupus flared during pregnancy that pregnancy was bad for the disease now we know that with the time passing the number of flares decreased the intensity of the flares decreased we have when we have a flare is mostly uh, cutaneous articular and except for those that have already uh, active renal disease. And in spite of uh, anything, the number of women with lupus getting pregnant is increasing all over the world. And they are uh, being diagnosed earlier, they are, have a better care, and they get pregnant because, you know, they are young women. And the age of the first pregnancy in the developed world is increasing. So more and more frequently we hear women at 35 to 40 years planning their first pregnancy and the situation where they are going for in vitro fertilization is also becoming more and more common all over the world. So uh, there are several studies and one of the, the most recent ones with a large number of patients shows that the, the rate of flare during pregnancy, of life birth during pregnancy is greater in Afro-descendant and in married women, and it's less in those that use cyclophosphamide and those that have a sli day of active disease. And one day I was in the clinic, in the pregnancy clinic, and this uh, lady uh, with lupus asked me to babysit her three 
babies, he t- three boys, because she was busy having her fourth. So this is, we had this dogma, and now we are helping patients have three, four babies. But lupus can be devastating sometimes, as you see here, but with the new drugs that are coming in the market, and this is one case, we had this lady that had this alopecia for more than 10 years and she was dependent on high dose steroids. Now she's on um, bliss inhibitor without any steroids and improving very much all her uh, arthritis and other features too. And we know that we're dealing with young women that have their fertility preserved, except those that are exposed to cyclophosphamide. And I think this is, um, we know that, but when we say that to our patients, I'm going to start giving you a treatment that you have to come here and take an IV cyclophosphamide, and you can't get pregnant while you're on cyclophosphamide. I learned that many patients understand that cyclophosphamide is contraceptive, and then they stop the contraception they're using. So make sure you are understood because they arrive in the, in the pregnancy clinic while on cyclophosphamide or other X drugs like methotrexate also, and they, th- their excuse is that, well, but my doctor told me I wasn't going to get pregnant if I use this drug. So this is an important message that I want you to take home. Uh, we know that women that are exposed to cyclophosphamide have an increased risk of ovarian failure, and those that are using any kind of NSAID, including COX inhibitors, may have uh, an inhibition of the follicle rupture. And if they are planning to get pregnant, this may be a problem. And also when the disease is active, like the lady with the alopecia I showed you and the other skin and other things, it may interfere with sex life. But as you are good doctors and you take good care of your patients, they will get better and they will get pregnant. So the counseling is what we need to do, and I think we should do it at every consult. Every time you see your patient, it's not a waste of time. Spend a minute, two minutes, and talk about how are you doing your contraception, do you have plans to get pregnant, let's plan the right time. And when is that? First, of course you don't want any active nephritis patients getting pregnant. So we try to avoid the period while they're on the induction therapy. We try to have them free of proteinuria for six months at least until we say you're okay to get pregnant now. Same thing for CNS disease. We don't want anyone with active CNS disease pregnant. Those that have pulmonary hypertension have a bad prognosis. It, it, It gets worse during pregnancy. Mostly related to antiphospholipid antibodies, the stroke in the first two years after a stroke is a worse prognosis in terms of a new thrombotic event, even if they are anticoagulated. So we try to counsel those uh, women that had a stroke. They will be able to get pregnant, but it's better to wait two years. There is a lot of uh, publication, and our experience showed that too, that those women that get pregnant in the first one or two years after being diagnosed with lupus, when we don't know exactly the form of the disease, the, what organ de- uh, involvement they will have. Um, so the, when they get pregnant in these first two years, or even when they develop lupus during pregnancy, it tends to have more flares and more difficult to control. Uh, we spoke about the NSAIDs and the COX-2, and the list of the X drugs that we will show. But one of the most commonly asked questions that the mothers and the family ask us is, what is the chance of my child having lupus? We say it's about 2%. We know that our, there are families that have more autoimmune disease, but it doesn't mean that the mother with lupus will have a baby with lupus. <clears throat> the X drugs, they are well known because of thalidomide, cyclophosphamide, of course, but also methotrexate, leflunomide has some safe data now, so that's why I put the question mark there. 
uh, MMF is classified as X, bisphosphonate, and this is uh, also serious because it may take 10 years for a landronate to get uh, completely cleared, so, and it can cause bone damage in the fetus. Statins, of course, we have to stop statins, as well as misoprostol and the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II inhibitors as well. But as I was saying, we treat them and they feel better and they get pregnant. She had the flare during pregnancy and now she's... Actually, I, she was enrolled in one of those studies with bliss inhibitors. So we learned a lot and our chairman here was a great contributor for our learning in terms of the advice of, about contraception. We know now, based on, on his study and also from Michelle Petrie, that the estrogens do not increase the rate of flare, do not induce flare in lupus that have not that don't have antiphospholipid antibodies or APS. So estrogen may induce thrombosis related to antiphospholipid, but lupus there is quiescent, it's okay to use estrogen if that's an option for you. And there are several uh, studies, and the systematic review that I mentioned here showed us that the benefits of a good contraception uh, outweighs the potential risk. But this is an interesting study, and it was done at the University of California in San Francisco, where they interviewed women at a fertile age, and they found that from the 20, 206 patients that were interviewed, 86 had uh, at risk an unplanned pregnancy. And 59% reported in San Francisco that they had no counseling about the risk of pregnancy and the disease and the medication they were on. So, and this was very inconsistent with their contraceptive use. 53, more than half of the patients were using only barrier, which we know it's not so efficient. And our favorite and more efficient type of, of um, contraception that are the intrauterine devices were only used by 13%. And the last comment about this review, was about this um, paper, was that even women that were being exposed to methotrexate, to MMF, they were equally uh, advised as anyone else that was only on hydroxychloroquine, which is safe for pregnancy, about the risk and the ideal contraception that they should be using. So we should learn from that experience. So the, a better counseling and planning is an unmet need for all of us, and we have to insist on that. The IUD may be the ideal option for long-term contraception, especially in those that have antiphospholipid antibodies and, of course, APS. And in addition to asking us the chances of the, their babies of having lupus, Women with lupus also ask us very frequently about the, the medication that they're being used during pregnancy and for breastfeeding, so we need to know that, and the interaction between the disease and pregnancy. So again, counseling is the key word here. So pregnancy may induce a flare in lupus, and we know that from many publications from since the 1980s. It's mostly cutaneous articular and the pathogenic explanation we spoke already. But one of the things that came up in many papers was that they found that in many centers, not today, but in the past, they were withdrawing the antimalarials. And this could be a reason for a triggering of flare in addition to the pregnancy itself. So we know now that hydroxychloroquine should not be withdrawn and it is recommended during pregnancy of lupus patients. So the literature is very um, controversial, the numbers are, the variation is wide, but it depends also on what do we call flare during lupus pregnancy. And then um, we have to think that 
Any woman that was pregnant here had low back pain, knee pain, had facial erythema, could have had dyspnea, and if she had lupus, it would be probably attributed to lupus. But any normal woman has anemia, for example. So we have to know, and this table helps us there, to see what can be of normal pregnancy and confound with lupus. But if your patient has a real full-blown arthritis and fever with no uh, infection, this can be due to lupus for sure. The carpal tunnel syndrome, it can be diagnosed in up to 30% in the third trimester. And it's uh, temporary. After the baby is delivered and they, their edema goes away, they will get better. So we have to know that. Um, there are things that can occur during pregnancy that are complications of pregnancy that can also be confusing in terms of uh, lupus flare, like the drop in the hematocrit. We measure the hemo hemoglobin, and anemia can be normal during pregnancy. Thrombocytopenia can occur in pregnancy, and we don't even look at the acute phase reactants because we know they go up. So, SED rate, CRP, they go up during pregnancy, so it's not a a measurement that we follow. But if your patient has leukopenia, lymphopenia, anti-DNA, then it's lupus. And if she presents with this vasculitis, then it's probably related to lupus. Our chairwoman did a very nice uh, job reviewing the three forms that we have that are, uh, were adapted to uh, evaluate flare during pregnancy. So, the SLE day with a P in the middle because of pregnancy was adapted and we are looking at it to follow our patients during pregnancy and always thinking of the confounding factors that we will rule out or we'll have to exclude to know that is not related to pregnancy itself but to lupus. So, we can use the SLE day to evaluate flare during pregnancy, but it is adapted and it's called sleep day. And there's the SLAM also, the modified SLAM. It has a scoring uh, and it's divided, also includes fatigue. Of course, weight loss is not, uh, it's excluded from the SLAM adapted for pregnancy, but it's another tool that you can use to follow up your patient and to understand if she's going on a flare during pregnancy and it, of course it will help you scoring them properly, properly uh, to take a decision on the treatment that you are going to recommend. The LAIP also is a scoring system. It looks a little bit more complicated, but I think it has a, a very interesting advantage here that it also takes into account the medication that the patients are using. So you will score also the medication. And the final score, this was uh, reviewed and validated by Guillermo Ruiz Irastosa in uh, a good number of patients. And it showed this method here, the LAP, has a more than 90% sensitivity and specificity in finding out if your patient is having a flare during pregnancy. <coughs> Sorry. So what are the predictors at time of conception that will tell you that your patient has a worse prognosis? Of course, if they have active nephritis, if they have CNS disease, if they were uh, using cyclophosphamide, recent diagnostic or during pregnancy, if they had a flare in the past six months, and something that we can avoid, the withdrawal of antimalarials. So we need to speak to our obstetric friends and tell them that we've been using it for a long time, that it's safe, but regardless of that, there's still a lot of obstetricians that are scared because it's classified as letter D. And we don't understand why, but that's 
how it is. So the ideal in terms of renal involvement is to have six to 12 months remission until you say your patient it's okay to get pregnant. And what about that situation? Patient arrives to you, uh, usually around 24, 28 weeks, and they have edema, hypertension, proteinuria. It can be lupus nephritis, even if they never had before. It can be preeclampsia, which is usually after 20 weeks, while lupus nephritis and APS microangiopathy can occur at any time period during pregnancy. But looking at the table here and, and seeing from uh, retrospective studies, it's easy. But when you're there and you have to decide what to do, it's not so easy. So the uric acid may help because it goes up in preeclampsia. Uh, hemolytic anemia, we can have it in, in lupus nephritis and APS sometimes, but not in preeclampsia. And the simple uh, urine sediment can help us a lot because you won't expect to see casts or dysmorphism uh, of the red blood cells in preeclampsia, neither in microangiopathy of APS. There are uh, anti-DNA, of course, and complement consumption is related to nephritis, uh, as you know, but we have to remember that complement also is an acute phase reactant, so it goes up during pregnancy. So you need to have the baseline and follow your patient complement level at every time she's going to be measured, and don't go for the uh, normal range that the lab gives to you, but to your patient, and if it's dropping, that means she's consuming complement. There are uh, more recently new markers like the VGF, the PLDGF, interferon gamma that are being studied and are coming up as new markers that may help us um, differentiate these three different situations that have the same phenotype, the same manifestations, and that can be very tricky because we have to take a decision fast and give the appropriate treatment. So, the involvement of the kidney is the greatest marker of outcome in pregnancy. And not only if they are active, but even if they had past nephritis, according to several studies, it increases the chances of fetal loss, increases the chance of preterm delivery, and also it is related, of course, to hypertension and to other complications, even preeclampsia. So, um, we have a big uh, clinic, we learned a lot from the literature, but we have to pay attention to our patients. That's where I think we learn more. We are uh, reviewing the literature from important centers like the center in Barcelona, the Mayo Clinic, and even ourselves, and they all show the same thing. If patients uh, get pregnant and they had the past nephritis, even if when they were treated properly and went into remission, their outcome is worse than those that never had lupus nephritis. And we have to be aware of that, and that's why we call this a high-risk OB follow-up, because we are going to follow them closely. We have to be in a good, common relationship with the obstetricians and sometimes the nephrologists and other specialists and decide what to do fast and, the, and for the best of our patients. In our center, uh, we have a protocol that we follow. In addition to the normal pregnancy protocol, we look in the baseline for all the markers. We recommend to repeat the antiphospholipid test and the anti rho anti la even if your patient had it done in the past. We recommend monthly visits until week 18, then from 18 to 27 weeks every three weeks, then 27 to 33 we see the patients uh, twice a month, then from 33 weeks on we go for weekly consults. 
We don't uh, plan C-sections, even though many patients in the first consult, they say, when is my cesarean going to be? We, we are always trying to have um, a normal delivery, and if the fetus in is, is in a situation that requires C-section, then we're going to go for a cesarean session. But we try to keep the pregnancy as long as we can, and we follow up them with the morphological ultrasound and we do the Doppler that has a very good predictive value uh, every month from 20 weeks on. So this is a long uh, re a review of the cases of the Toronto, Dr. Daphne Gladman, showing that from her 193 pregnancies since the 1970s, those that had a past renal involvement were those that had significantly more low birth weight babies and flares during pregnancy. This is the Toronto uh, data bank. This is a meta-analysis that included several studies, 37 studies, and then a large uh, cohort number of pregnancies. And the maternal complications were again related to nephritis and the fetal complications related to nephritis, but also to antiphospholipids, in, regardless if they had thrombosis or not. It could be only obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome. So these two are the major markers that predict maternal hypertension and prematurity. And the previous nephritis, according to other studies also, including uh, one study from London, one from Mexico City, showing that uh, the hypertension in the first trimester was a huge predictor of bad outcome with preterm and preeclampsia. And here, in the study from Mexico, the fetal outcome was not too much different between the groups with past uh, renal disease or not, but they had more renal flares and maternal complications in the group that had past nephritis. And of course, at that study also, the active nephritis during conception was the marker of the worst prognosis. This uh, major effort is a collaboration that Jill Bion is also involved. It was um, published uh, end of last year. The first author was my, is my mentor, Michael Lockshin. The PROMISE study is led by Jane Solomon. It's still ongoing, but this part of the study showed that the lupus anticoagulant was the stronger predictor of adverse fetal outcome, uh, including in those that have APL only, without antiphospholipid syndrome, with lupus, or those that have only APL or APS without lupus. So the PROMISE study uh, so far involved um, 610 patients, but they're still being followed up, and there is more data coming up. But for now, we are certain that this marker, the lupus anticoagulant, is the greatest marker of uh, bad prognosis of the fetus. Now, talking about treatment. Hydroxychloroquine should not be discontinued. It is safe for the mother, for the fetus. We did a prospective study. We didn't find any uh, teratogenic effect. It is also well tolerated during uh, breastfeeding. In our study, we found that the sleep day decreased more than in the control group that received all the other standard of care. We were able to taper prednisone, and of course this is a great advantage for us during pregnancy, and we found less preeclampsia in the group on hydroxychloroquine, which is also an interesting finding. They had babies at a higher gestational age and weight, and there were, we waited the babies to uh, be older than three to evaluate uh, visual and general pediatric and uh, ear uh, function. Hearing was not impaired, visual was not impaired, 
and so there are other studies also looking at it retrospectively that did not find any ocular events related to toxicity of hydroxychloroquine during pregnancy. Prednisone and prednisolone are inactivated in the placenta by the 11-beta dehydrogenase. So you can use to treat the mother, but of course you have to use the dose that is efficient and try to taper it as fast as you can because you will spare the common side effects that everybody knows. So the story about the cleft palate is uh, very low. It's like 0.1% from a large data bank. And we have always to supplement calcium and vitamin D during pregnancy with prednisone or not. Betamethasone or dexamethasone is used in certain cases where you have uh, first, second degree uh, heart block. I think uh, Jill will talk about this more uh, thoroughly tomorrow. And we use hydrocortisone to supplement the adrenal function for the stress of the delivery. Azathioprine is an another... Um, confounding with the FDA classification because it, it has a, a, a letter D, but this is based on studies in animals. In the human fetal um, liver, the fetus is not capable of uh, transforming azathioprine to mercaptopurine, so it doesn't harm the fetus. Of course, there are cases that were related to transient leukopenia and infections uh, of the neonatal, but if you need to use a high dose of prednisone, we always uh, add azathioprine, and it's a steroid sparing agent. And now, more recently, the American College of Pediatrics uh, declared it's safe for lactation as well. And, um, a recent publication by uh, Matthias Schneider in Germany showed that in, in Germany they plan when they want to get pregnant, different from Brazil. So when they switch mycophenolate to azathioprine, the results in the patients that were on maintenance therapy for nephritis, the results are the same as those that were on azathioprine to start with. So it's good news for us, and again, planning, counseling can help a lot. Anti-Rho, mostly the 52KD type, uh, is related to neonatal lupus. It crosses the placenta. It can cause skin rash or it can cause congenital heart block and other heart uh, arrhythmias. It's not only related to lupus, as you know, it, you, can, you can find it in normal women. It's predictor of Sjogren or lupus in the future. But what do we do when you, you have a pregnant woman that has antero. We recommend fetal echo Doppler every one to two weeks from week 18 to 28, according to our professor here. Unfortunately, when you diagnose the, the third degree heart block, it's not reversible. Sometimes we treat them in order to prevent the complications that that can cause with uh, high drops. But it's not reversible, and most of these cases will need a, a pacemaker. And the, the cases that uh, are born with the skin reaction is transient. It will go away after six months, but you have to avoid sun exposures, exposure. And we had some cases that the kids, the babies, had skin infection and complicated. So it's benign, but not so benign. And the, the betamethasone treatment, which is not so good as we wanted it to be, can uh, develop these side effects that are not so simple to deal with. This is one of my babies that was born with uh, anti uh, row related neonatal lupus. Uh, she was, um, when she was born, she had 52, 54 heart rate, and she lived with that until she was 12 years old, then she needed a pacemaker. She's the first, the same girl, I'm getting old here. She's the first student in her class, so we're very proud of her. We have another um, bunch of patients, but about the same as the literature. Half of them need a pacemaker. It's a very 
cost, high cost uh, um, condition, and if we could prevent it, it would be very nice. But recently, it was shown that IVIG was not also, was not able to prevent because if you had a baby with a neonatal lupus heart block, you have a 20% chance of having a second one, and Jill showed it didn't work to prevent. So in terms of morbidity of the fetus, the early predictors in the first trimester are proteinuria, antiphospholipid syndrome, thrombocytopenia, and hypertension. This is from the Hopkins cohort. And this is what we see also. And the thing that we can make better, the treatment adherence. So we have to talk to our patients, we have to tell them that hydroxychloroquine is safe. We, I always show other babies that the mothers took hydroxychloroquine during pregnancy, and this is a, a thing that reassures the patients. So concordance, more than compliance, is what we want. The anticardiolipin antibodies, especially IgG anticardiolipin, is related to fetal loss. The higher the titer, and if, the woman ha if this woman had the past history of fetal loss and she's not treated with a high titer IgG anticardiolipid, she has more than 80% chance of having another fetal loss. And we're talking mostly about late, second trimester losses. So, recurrent fetal loss, but also preterm, preeclampsia, and according to the criteria, three recurrent, now early, less than 10 weeks, consecutive abortions are the features that are related to APS during pregnancy, or better, to APL during pregnancy. But we know that intrauterine growth restriction, fetal distress, premature rupture of membranes are also related. They are major complications of pregnancy that can be related to APL. Infertility and IVF failure is a very tricky area here. In my opinion, it is not clear, I'm not convinced that infertility is related to antiphospholipid antibodies, although many people in the infertility clinics are testing for all the tests that we know and other tests that we don't even have do in the routine, and they're offering treatment for these patients. So it's a, it's a situation here that's very complicated. And in addition to the, the conditions that can happen to the, the baby itself, there are other complications during pregnancy because we know pregnancy is a prothrombotic situation by itself. So you can have not only any site of thrombosis, but also thrombocytopenia and catastrophic APS, which can be uh, manifested as a HELP syndrome. So for APS patients, we recommend also the high-risk follow-up with frequent visits, uh, close monitoring of the blood pressure and the urine, uh, urinary uh, spot test that we do routinely, and instead of the 24-hour urine that we only do in certain cases when we're in doubt. And if you suspect of thrombosis, you have to do a Doppler. Don't follow the D-dimer because the D-dimer is also another acute phase reactant. So try to find the thrombosis with an imaging and then you will have to offer some treatment to this patient. But one of the things that we learned from Mari Carmen Amigo and Munter Kamashta always repeats that too, is that we have to have a good relationship with the OBs, uh, the obstetricians, because this makes our life easier easier and certainly makes the prognostic of our uh, pregnancies much better. So I go to the OB clinic once a week with our residents and since 1994 and we have a huge um, clinic and good results. This is Professor Garavi which I will like to dedicate this presentation to. He was uh, he passed away in 2004 and was my mentor when I trained in New York, and I learned so much from him, not only this, but in real life too. So we follow this um, table according to the past history and the 
test that your patient has. So if your patient has never had an event, thrombotic event, and has a positive test, you can do just general care and try to avoid and eliminate the other risk factors, but you can use or, or low-dose aspirin with no risk and maybe you have good results. For early miscarriages, we use low-dose aspirin. If it fails, we move it. We move in the next uh, pregnancy to prophylactic doses of low molecular weight heparin plus low-dose aspirin. For those that had fetal losses on low-dose aspirin, we combine um, the full dose of low molecular weight heparin twice a day, and if they fail to this scheme combining aspirin and, and low molecular weight heparin full dose, then we do this again with IVIG monthly, one, milligram, one uh, gram per kilo every month until week 32. Those women that were on Coumadin and get pregnant, we have to stop the Coumadin right away. We know it's teratogenic, especially if the fetus is exposed between week 6 and 9, and we try to avoid it until 12 weeks. And uh, we have some experience in our center where we use Coumadin after 14 weeks of pregnancy. So we start with low-dose aspirin combined with heparin, non-fractionated, or uh, low molecular weight. Then we switch at 14 weeks. We still maintain them on aspirin all along. We don't stop for delivery. And then until 40, 35 weeks, we use Coumadin, we monitor, we keep their INR around 2.3, and then uh, we switch back at 35 weeks to heparin. Our results were good. We didn't have uh, an increase of uh, the number of uh, fetal losses was like in the normal population. The results were similar as the results with heparin, and we didn't have... Um, fetal complications, so before treatment they had almost 80% loss and then after this treatment it was around 15. We didn't have uh, embryopathies or major bleedings and fetal distress was responsible for a high rate of C-sessions and preterm delivery. But Coumadin was shown to be safe between 14 and 35 weeks, I know in the US you won't do it. And uh, there are some cases and, uh, that are like we were talking before, the confusion between lupus nephritis and microangiopathy. This is a woman with 16 weeks of pregnancy that was referred to us and the baby was already dead. She had a positive ANA and because of that she was having proteinuria and was treated for lupus nephritis. But she wasn't doing well, the treatment wasn't working. We had a renal biopsy that showed microangiopathy, and then we ch when we changed her immune suppression scheme to heparin, she got better, and after that she had another normal pregnancy. So again, the predictors of poor neonatal outcome, APS plus SLE more than APS uh, primary alone, thrombotic APS more uh, than obstetric APS, low complement, the IgMs for the infections, the triple positivity for antiphospholipids also is a marker, and those that had thrombotic events, mainly stroke, have a worse prognosis. <coughs> so this is an, um, a large review also from the 80s until recently, 410 pregnancies and 57 uh, failures, and 15% were on low-dose aspirin, 56% was on heparin and low-dose aspirin, prophylactic dose, and 28% on the full dose. So what that teaches us? First, uh, it's a multicenter case control, which will uh, respect these results. There, is, there are some patients that do not respond to the best treatment that you give them. And the predictors were triple positivity, the history of a thrombotic event, and the presence of active lupus or another systemic autoimmune disease. And once we have a baby that is born healthy, we celebrate, but we have to remember that the mother 
is still at risk for thrombosis. So the next six weeks is the time of the life of a woman after delivery that she's at highest risk for thrombosis. And if she has any phospholipid antibodies or lupus nephritis, even more. So we have to continue the anticoagulation treatment for six weeks. And if they were treated with Coumadin before for APS, then you switch back to Coumadin and monitor them closely. So we're trying to, instead of talking about compliance, which sounds more like you're giving an order, talking about concordance, where you explain the patient and they agree, they family, and we want them to be at a quiescent disease state, adjust the medication, find out about their antibodies profiles, explain them the maternal and the fetal prognosis, the important impact the psychological, the expectations of a pregnancy, and everything to do has to be based on a shared decision. So careful planning is the main take-home message. Medication must be adjusted, high-risk integrated clinic, find out if your patient has anti role and assess the antiphospholipids and the risk. Here's Professor Lockshin and Graham Hughes that taught us so much and we are so thankful for them, for our colleagues that work with us, our patients, the many babies we had along the time, and the number is increasing every week. So the idea is that you have to talk to your patients and not to yourself. Make sure you're understood. Listen to your patient and individualize every conduct and shared decision-making and concordance are the key to success. Thank you for your attention. So, Roger? Si. Oh. Here. Oh, good. Here. Yes. Yes. Please. Uh, Some... There's someone there, Jill. Is Here. there anybody there? On the right. Sometimes children born the mother with lupus don't have any future of the anti -rot a uh, uh, future of the anti rob at born. Do you have any experience in the follow up with this baby if, who, if he develop any manifestation, any, any features of the. Well, well I'm, I'm shy to talk about this next to you while I'm here, and I'm sure that you can't miss her talk tomorrow. She will talk about this. We do, uh, what we do is uh, um, echocardiogram an uh, electrocardiogram when the baby is born. We follow them uh, at least for six months for the skin uh, reaction. But usually, if the baby is born without any cardiac defect, they won't develop after. Usually, no, it's 100%. They won't develop after they are born. So, so the only caveat is, I, I totally agree with Roger, um, if you see nothing at birth, including not even first degree, so it's important to do an EKG. But there was a very curious report, um, I'm not saying that anyone can substantiate it, but there was an interesting report from Sweden where they did report in active pediatric, I think it was, the emergence of abnormal PR intervals in some of these children by the age of five. But the clinical significance of that is totally unknown, and at least from our perspective, if your EKG is totally normal at birth, we have never seen a problem after that. And obviously, echo is important too, because maybe there's endocardial fibromyelastosis or something that might be silent. That again would prompt continuous evaluation. We 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 looked at the PR intervals in the brothers of babies, but we didn't find any. We didn't either. <laughs> we didn't either. I, I didn't know if your question also related to the development of a rheumatic disease. I wasn't sure if, is that part of your question? Oh, we don't know. There is someone there. Yeah. Yes. I can't uh, Roger, here. If you could turn yeah. on the lights, I think it's okay. I don't mind. Okay. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm Yes. Nice. Uh, Roger, <laughs> thank you for your talk. What is your um, comment on vaccination in, in pregnancy? The in my country, there's a national policy and for a vaccination influenza and all pregnant people get vaccine. Sure, we follow that protocol. We vaccine, the, we give the vaccines for tetanus, for influenza, for a pregnant woman, yes. Have you seen any difference in lupus activity or APS? 
Not so far. Okay. I hope I won't. Here. Patricia, right? Uh, Roger, here, Alejandro. Uh, as always, an excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, a question. If you have a woman of 40 years old without lupus activity, she wants to be pregnant, but she can't. Uh, she wants to be fertilized. What do you recommend? Fertilization or adaptation? <laughs> well, no, this is, this is the situation that's very common, uh, I mean, all over the world. And the, the thing that will change your... They will do whatever they want to do regardless of what you recommend. What we have to know, if they have antiphospholipid antibodies and they will be exposed, exposed to a high dose of estrogen for induction of ovulation, then you have to give them uh, at least prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin. If they had thrombotic events, I would do it with a full dose of low molecular weight heparin in the induction of uh, ovulation. Okay? So, um, I have a question about HELP syndrome. Uh, so, you deliver the baby if the mother has HELP syndrome, but oftentimes it persists after the delivery. What do you do then? Mothers with HELP syndrome? Oh, yeah. HELP syndrome. HELP. HELP. Then what? what? So you deliver the baby. Early. But oftentimes the HELP syndrome persists after the delivery. Yeah. What do you do then? Well, sometimes you have to treat the preeclampsia and the nephritis and the microangiopathy. Some, well, if you can have a biopsy, it will help a lot of the kidney because you decide more precisely. But we had cases that we did everything that we treated with immune suppression, heparin, and had to deliver the baby. And sometimes it takes long. It's not like in the book that you say you take the baby out and preeclampsia is gone. It's true. I just had this past week a baby that was born 800 grams, and so far, He's still alive, but bad prognosis. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger, and thank you very much for your presentation.